you are going to be a presenter at the October Assist Conference, and your uh, topic is Spiritually Transformative Experiences That Have Changed History. Uh, earlier in the interview, you talked briefly about this, but I note that uh, Buddha uh, had to renounce his royal inheritance to become a wandering monk. Uh, we learn that uh, Jesus in Mark 3 was called mad by his own family, and Muhammad had to be re reassured by his wife about his mission. The spiritual experiences that these uh, founders of religions had were initially positive, but we do have zealots who have given us 9-11, as you've said. So uh, could you elaborate a bit more about uh, spiritually transformative experiences and how they have changed history? Well, they certainly have. You've given some very good examples from the lives of Jesus and Mohammed and Buddha, but let me give you another one which most people know about in the Christian tradition. Um, Saul of the city of Tarsus was a zealot and he thought it was his mission to kill Christians. This was something that he received in dreams and visions. This was his spiritually transformative experience. And he went around hanging and crucifying and killing Christians. And then one day on the road to Damascus, a blinding light came down and Jesus appeared. And in the vision, Jesus said, my son, why are you persecuting me? And in that instant, Saul knew that he had made a mistake. He was persecuting the wrong people. And so he was spiritually transformed. He became a Christian, spent the rest of his life doing missionary work, was very instrumental in founding the institution of Christianity in Rome. And then, alas, he too was killed by the Roman uh, zealots who were thinking that he was indeed a challenge to their pagan faith. So, he changed his name from Saul to Paul, and this was a spiritually transforming experience that happened very quickly. Now, sometimes it's not that quick. Gopi Krishna was a Hindu mystic, and I actually had the chance to interview him on two occasions. In his experience, he had a blinding light and felt energy come from the base of his spine up to the top of his head. It's what now we call a kundalini experience. Well, he claimed that he went stark raving mad for a couple of years and only slowly was able to pull this together. This indeed was a spiritual emergency, but eventually it became a spiritual emergence and he spent the rest of his life teaching people how to have transformative experiences slowly and safely through meditation, through visualization. And he welcomed people from all faiths and became very interdisciplinary and very ecumenical in what he would teach. Wrote many books that were very well received, books about spiritual wisdom. And his work continues and it's still going on today. We're talking about integrating two very different realities here. And when I talked to Elaine Stout on the phone, the founder of ASSIST, she asked her to describe her experience as briefly as she could. And she told me this. In a near-death experience, which she had, in a near-death experience, you awaken from the dream of life and find that you are home again in a forgotten world of love. And when you return to life, you become painfully aware that you are living in a dream and you are homesick for what is real. Could you talk about what that quote, what she just said? We are homesick for what is real? Yes, this is one person's experience with a near-death experience. Other people have very different experiences, but in this case, she had a glimpse of what she felt was the ultimate reality. It was like coming home. And many people who have near-death experiences no longer fear death because death to them is coming home. It's reuniting with the Godhead. And it can be very transformative in their life. However, there are other people who have a near-death experience who feel that they've gone to hell and they are persecuted by demons and they have a terrible time and can't wait for the experience to be over. So 
Not all near-death experiences are positive or salubrious. Now, personally, I think the folks that have the hellish experiences just don't have the background to create a framework in which they can appreciate the near-death experience. And the closest that they can come to all of these visions are the fables and stories that they've heard about going to hell. And so they sort of create their own hell, but that's just my opinion. So any of these spiritual transformative experiences we talk about do have a dark side. And this is why a person who works with these experiences has to be very, very careful to guide a person accentuating the positive, taking the person through an emergency into something where positive traits like love and compassion and community service will emerge. Yolaine said that an experience is spiritually transforming when it causes people to, perce to perceive themselves and the world profoundly differently. How might a person who's had this experience perceive the world in a profoundly different way? How does the world become different for them? Well, let's start by using a negative example. Some people who have spiritually transformative experiences come out of it saying, okay, I've got to kill all the Christians. I've gotten orders from the gods that the Christians all have to die. Or they might come out of it saying, I've got to kill all the Muslims, or I've got to kill all the Jews, or I've got to kill all the people who provide for abortion, or I've got to kill all of the gays and lesbians. And people believe this. This is part of their transformation. They've been transformed into zealots who have murder on their mind. Well, this is a spiritually transforming experience. In terms of my values, I would see this as an alienating experience. It separates people. For me, a positive spiritually transforming experience is one that brings people together, one that is unitive, one that unites, one that shows love and compassion. And there's a biblical verse by their fruits you will know them. You take a look at people who claim to have had spiritual transforming experiences and see how they live their lives. Are they living their lives in a spirit of acceptance, compassion, love, neighborliness, helpfulness, or are they doing just the opposite? So these are the criteria that I would use if I were asked to make an evaluation. Some people who have had these experiences actually reject the values of their culture and they find that uh, adjusting to a society he sees as, as profoundly sick doesn't make sense. How might they view society as being profoundly sick after having um, experienced a reality that is so different? Yes, some people come out of their spiritually transforming experience with the conviction that their society is not healthy. There's too much emphasis on making money. There's too much of a caste system with the 1% of rich people owning 40% of all of the money. Or that there's a lot of divisiveness. Political parties can't work together to create a better society. All right, now some of those people decide to withdraw they go into a monastery, a Christian monastery, or a Buddhist monastery, whatever, and pray and meditate. They think they can make the greater change from there. Other people jump right into the fray and become political activists and use their experience to take active steps that they never would have done before the experience. So people can go in a number of different ways once they are convinced that the society is sick. Now, of course, I think this is simplistic. I think that our society and most other societies do have their areas of dysfunction, but they also have their areas of strength and positive uh, values. I think that uh, the United States has a lot of things about it that can be criticized, but on the other hand, where in the world do you have a society made of, of so many different and diverse groups of people ethnic groups, r religious groups, linguistic groups, um, 
people of different colors, people of different sexual orientations, people of different backgrounds that is hung together for better or for worse. This is quite remarkable. I think this is the strength of America that there is a unity here that people often neglect when they see the divisions. And I don't think that you can find any other country in the world that has this much diversity in such a large population where people more or less still get along. Yes, it can be better, but it's made quite a remarkable uh, statement to the world since the republic or the democracy, as you want, whatever you want to call it, was founded. The scientific community often views these experiences as hallucinations. What matters at ASSIST is not the content of the spiritually transformative experience, but the effect it has on your life. The impact of the spiritually transformative experience brings a validity. It is self-validating in a way that a hallucination cannot be. Would you want to comment on that? Yes, indeed. I followed the scientific literature and the neurological literature, and I think that uh, it's taken us a long distance in terms of understanding the changes going on in the brain while somebody is having a out-of-body experience, a near-death experience, uh, other types of spiritually transformative experiences, of course there are going to be changes. And I think that this is good news. It means the experience is real. The person is not making it up. The person is not impressing other people by telling a story. The person is not having a crazy hallucination. No, these are real changes in the brain while the person is talking with the spirits, incorporating the spirits, going out of the body, having a spontaneous healing, whatever. So the neurological changes that go on, I think, attest to the reality of the experience. And you know, mind and body are together. Of course, what happens in the mind is going to be reflected in what happens to the body. What happens in the body is going to be reflected in what happens in the mind. So I think that this is very good news for people interested in this topic. And then above all else, what is the change in the person's behavior and attitude? You can get as much data as you want from an electroencephalograph or magnetic resonance imaging or some of these other sophisticated neurological devices. Say, yes, these are changes in the person's brain. Fine. What changes are there in a person's life? Is the person more compassionate, more helpful, more loving? Or is the person still abusing her husband, whipping her children, or gouging his financial associates, or stealing money from the bank? If so, this experience has not been transformative at all. What separates us from the world of spirit? Where is it? And why isn't this reality available to us always? You know, there are some societies where this reality is more readily available than in so-called civilized Western societies. If a person wants to have a communication with the deceased loved one, or wants to talk to their totem, their animal power, their bird uh, guide, they have a ritual by which they can do this. Or they can go to the shaman, or the medicine man, the medicine woman, and they can be assisted to do this. So, in a lot of Aboriginal, traditional, indigenous societies, these experiences are fairly available. It's just in Western society, where people get no training in this, and where these experiences don't have no respect, as Rodney Dangerfield famously said, that it's difficult for us to have these on demand. We don't have the structure, we don't have the rituals, we don't have the orientation or the acceptance in our society to make them easily available. Aldous Huxley once said that the brain is a reducing valve. It's like a reducing valve, and that the brain limits our awareness so that we can function in a three-dimensional world. How do you feel about this notion as the brain is a reducing valve? Well, Aldous Huxley isn't the only one who has come up with that idea. It certainly makes a great deal of sense. There are so many stimuli coming in upon us that one 
uses one's personal mythology, as we discuss in our book by the same name, one uses one's personal mythology to decide what should come in and what should be screened out. You know, traditional societies believe that the spirits are around us all the time. In Western society, the spirits might come rapping on the door and they're sent away. Don't bother me again. I don't recognize you. This is not part of my upbringing. So I think that the reducing valve uh, model of Aldous Huxley is very important. There's another thing that Aldous Huxley said, which is very critical. He said, it's not so much the event that's important, the things that happen to us in our lives, it's the interpretation that we give to that event. So, a person is in an automobile accident and they wake up and they're out of the body. Okay, they have an out of body experience, what do they do with this? Many people are told by their doctor, just forget about it, this is a common symptom. While other people will think, okay, what did you learn? Who did you talk to? What did you uh, have as an insight that can help you from this experience? So, the experience that we have or the result of an event is what can really propel us forward. Aldous Huxley was a very, very wise man and we can read his books again and his wife, Laura Huxley, is a very, very wise woman. I knew her very well. I never met Aldous, but she carried on his work after he passed on. Dr. Kramer, I have, a, I have a question about consciousness. Consciousness is a question that uh, atheists uh, can't understand, that they can understand uh, human life coming as a result of uh, biology, as a result of evolution, but they're puzzled about the nature of consciousness. I mean, where does it come from? And this brings me to ask you a question about the hard problem in physics, which is, how can something as immaterial as consciousness arise from something as unconscious as matter? How do you feel about this? Well, I think that this is a very important research topic. And it wasn't until recently that you had a great many top drawer scientists even considering this topic. I think that, first of all, the word consciousness can be defined in many different ways. And all of the researchers have their own definition of consciousness, which is why I try to use other terms that aren't as contentious. But nevertheless, the so-called hard problem persists. How can something as ephemeral and subtle as awareness, making sense out of the things around us, come from the brain and other parts of the body, which can be measured, which is what we call an example of matter? And I would say, well, why not? This is the nature of the universe. The universe is so set up that it is self-organizing. It puts itself together in a way that's going to ensure its existence. And it's going to adapt to whatever will help it get along and survive. So here we have small animals, large animals like human beings, other species, and to some extent or another, they're aware they react to what's around them. They plan ahead. They pay attention. They think, in other words. They feel emotions. Well, all of these are examples of what we might call consciousness. And this is what helped intelligent and conscious beings survive. And this is where evolutionary theory is such a big help to us because it shows that just random mutations, if they're useful, can persist and can help us to do better in the world and can survive, whereas organisms that don't have these experiences fall by the wayside and their genes drop out of the gene pool. So my answer to this is go back to evolution and you'll see that this is a gradual unfolding that starts out as being hit and miss, but what is helpful what makes people uh, adapt and other animals adapt to the environment, that will remain. Okay, now, what's the connecting link between mind and matter? I think they're already connected. 
I think that mind is subtle matter. I think that matter is dense mind. I have never been able to see the difference here. There are people far smarter than I am who believe that there are quantum mechanical activities in the brain, in the very, very small fibers in the brain, and this is what makes consciousness possible. So quantum physics might be a lead here. Now we have the announcement of the boson particle, <laughs> this subatomic particle which is so elementary, some people are calling it the God particle. Well, there's much that we don't know about the universe. Dark matter, the universe is composed of some 97% dark matter. Nobody has any idea what it is. So how can we come to a rational conclusion of what the universe is all about and what consciousness is all about when we're studying only 3% of what's actually out there? We have to take a little bit of modesty and be a little bit more patient before we can make final judgments on such important topics. Uh, Near-death experiencers are convinced that death is not the end, that, are, that there is a consciousness after death. So my question is, if consciousness is a product of evolution, and if consciousness is brain-based, how can it continue after physical death? Well, why not? We don't know the limits of the brain. We don't know the limits of the body. Keep in mind, that atheism and theism really don't have much to do with it. I have known some atheists who think that survival of bodily death is completely possible. It doesn't have anything to do with God at all. It's just the way that the brain and body are constructed. And that this subtle element of the brain-body connection has a survival value that not only helps while a person is alive, but goes on after death. And then, of course, there are some people who flip things on their head and say, well, consciousness came first. Consciousness is something from which matter evolved. You're talking about downward causation. Yes, this is downward causation. These people often make a very strong case for it. Now, people that believe in downward causation of course, there's no problem there in terms of the survival of part of the personality after death. So these are intriguing questions. I think they're well worthy of our study. Far be it from me to uh, come up with an answer at this time. I follow the arguments, I read the literature, and it's an unending source of delight and amazement. If ego identity is a fiction, as the Buddhists contend, then what kind of identity continues after death? And what does a medium communicate with if there is, quote, no person to communicate with if ego is a fiction? First of all, you're using some loaded terms. The type of ego that the Buddhists claim is a fiction is the socially constructed ego, is the identity that we have as a result of the society in which we live. Go back to Carl Jung, he talks about the self with a capital S. This is something that is more basic than ego with a small e, and itself with a capital S that has the survival, and that represents the core essence of a human being, and after the body dies, no, this might not have a lot of specific memories, but it might have the feelings of compassion and love and beauty and joy that have been built up over a lifetime, that were not socially conditioned, were not constructed the way the ego was. Okay, Dr. Gripper, the last question. Uh, some atheists as, as I've, that I've known are shocked to see and communicate with an entity they call Jesus during a near-death experience. Yet, People in remote tribes in, say, New Guinea do not report seeing Jesus. What does this tell us? Is the archetypal world a mental construct existing independent somewhere? Can you talk to us about an, an archetypal world that is dependent on what culture a person comes from? That's my last question. Sure, that's a fine question. According to Carl Jung, 
the collective unconscious contains a number of archetypes, a number of images that actually have a physical as well as a mental basis. The great parent archetype, because everybody has had parents. The wise childlike archetype, because children are all around us. And the talking animal archetype, because we see animals all around us. So the way that these archetypes are expressed depends upon cultural tradition and cultural conditioning. And Jung pointed this out. So somebody brought that a Western Christian tradition is going to encounter this archetype, this font of wisdom and guidance, maybe as Jesus Christ. Somebody brought up in another tradition might experience this as Moses. Another tradition might see it as Allah or Allah or as the Buddha or as Krishna or in an indigenous society as a wise elder, as a um, totem animal. But there's a deeper reality behind all of these surface characterizations. And the deeper reality is that this wise figure is there in our psyches. It's a potential for us. It's something to which we can go for advice and wisdom through prayer, through ritual, through meditation, through contemplation, by going inward, but also by going outward. We can reach it both ways. And it's there, it's a basic human potential. And this is something apart from the ego, the ego that the Buddhists say disappear upon death. This is something much more basic and something that is the great unit of force of human beings and probably other forms of life as well. Dr. Gribner, I'd like to thank you so much for this interview and I very much look forward to hearing your talk and the talks of the other presenters at the ASSIST conference from October 18 to October 20th in San Mateo. Thank you. Thank you.